Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Andrew Shikiar. I'm FIDO Alliance's Executive Director and Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, we're here today to talk about the FIDO device onboard specification. This is FIDO's IoT um, spec that we announced intention to launch um, just under two years ago, and, and we're very pleased to have launched this and uh, to have all of you here today to learn more about FIDO device onboard. Before we get started, um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, um, everyone, all of you in attendance are in listen-only mode. Um, so no need to talk. <laughs> um, but we, we're, we do um, want you to know, first of all, the, the webinar is being recorded. That's always a popular question. This will, will be recorded as soon as it's posted and, and archived. We'll send everyone an email to let you know about that. Um, secondly, there will be Q&A. Uh, we certainly want your questions. Uh, the way to do that is to ask your questions in the question widget. Um, just type them in as soon as you have them. We'll be queuing them up and answering them during a live Q&A session at the end. Um, if there's some very quick answers we can provide, we'll do that um, directly, but otherwise we'll, we'll take them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, again, I mentioned the recording and slides will be emailed to you and posted on our site. And last but not least, uh, we ask that you, you know, please stay on to, to take a survey at the end of the webinar or when you log off. It's really important to us to get your feedback. Uh, this helps inform the direction of this webinar program. Um, and um, and for, for future content. We already got one question. Yes, the recording will be able to be shared with others who are not able to attend today. So those who are on the list um, who did not show up will also get it as is well, anyone who uh, visits our website once it's posted. So I'm pleased to be joined today by the co-chairs of FIDO's IoT Technical Working Group, uh, Richard Kurzlake uh, from Intel and Gary Mandiam from, uh, from Qualcomm. Uh, both have uh, you know, led uh, the working group to this point um, and will give you insights into the, the FIDO device onboard spec and related market implications. So before we get into that, um, I want to give some background on FIDO to those of you who are, are newer to the Alliance. Um, you know, one really exciting thing for FIDO Alliance you know, in, in, in IoT is so this is really a new space for us. Um, it steps outside our historical practice in, in user authentication. So for those of you who are newer to FIDO, just a bit of background before we dig into FIDO device onboard. Um, you know, this is FIDO's vision and mission statement. Um, you know, basically, you know, FIDO you know, brings together motivated experts uh, from leading companies uh, to work together uh, to drive standardization of uh, secure authentication uh, technologies. Um, our, our goal is to provide simpler, stronger authentication that installs trust and confidence in the digital world, uh, but doing so in a very collaborative, open fashion that is responsive to market demands um, and, and rapidly brings interoperable products to market. So who is FIDO Alliance? Who signed up to this mission? Um, this is our board of directors, right? So like any membership organization, we have tiers of membership. Uh, we have a board of around 42, com uh, 42 companies. We have over 250 organizations worldwide uh, comprised across the different membership levels. But when I look at this list of, of, of companies and across kind of the makeup of our membership in general, a few things jump out at me. Um, first of all, you know, we have the right companies sitting around the table, right? So our focus initially has been user authentication, um, and that's why this, this, this composition is so important. We have the companies that you know, build the platforms and devices that are shipping at massive scale, um, contributing to FIDO Alliance. Uh, we have experts in security, and identity, biometrics, now IoT, um, helping you know, provide you know, technical expertise. And then last but not least, we have the service providers whose businesses you know, are dependent upon our ability to deliver you know, high assurance services to billions of users worldwide, uh, both for consumer services and now, as we look at IoT, um, you know, through devices that will touch uh, millions or billions of users. Um, so this is who comprises FIDO Alliance, this is who drives, this, this, these are the organizations that identify the use cases and drives development of our specifications. And you know, one reason why FIDO decided to take this work on is that not only do we have the right companies in the room to look at IoT, but we also have a successful track record of collaboration. Um, and that's resulted in, you know, in a pretty rapid period in around eight, eight plus years, eight to nine years, you know, three sets of specifications released on market and widely adopted. Um, 
and then growing platform support for user authentication specifications, right? So in around eight years, FIDO went from a whiteboard concept to something that has been rapidly um, embraced in devices and by service providers. You know, all told, um, you know, through the platforms we're showing here, the browsers we're showing here, over 4 billion devices can support user authentic FIDO user authentication, and over 86% of web browsers support FIDO authentication as well. Um, these are important data points in general, as you think about deploying FIDO authentication, but also important to think about in the lens of, well, can FIDO be successful here? And we feel like based on this track record, we have been, and we absolutely can be and will be in the IoT space as well. And these are the companies that are, you know, these are these are representative of the types of companies that are deploying FIDO today, right? So big brands uh, spanning industries and borders and use cases from consumer to payments, to enterprise, to embedded. Um, you know, this is really a strong validation that not only is FIDO able to, um, you know, identify and develop specifications, but that they're market ready and, and they're being utilized at massive scale today. And that, that's only growing as we move forward. So that's the background on FIDO. You know, that's kind of the, the, the impetus or the, the heft that we bring into this effort. Um, so with that, I want to turn things over to Richard uh, to talk in more detail about the FIDO device onboard activity. Thanks, Andrew. I mean, first thing uh, off, maybe we should just start about, you know, what is the problem we're trying to address here? And I think this is a, a very simple data point that really just says, based on survey data that was carried out a few years ago in 2017, we actually asked people, how long does it typically take to manually onboard a, a device, be it a gateway or a sensor, to their solution, to their platform? And the answer we got was roughly 20 minutes a device. So you do the math, and even for 10,000 devices, very quickly you realize this runs into several years of effort. Obviously, scale that to 100,000 devices, a million, let alone a billion, and you realize that even from a, a resourcing viewpoint, from a, uh, from a sheer cost viewpoint, this is clearly not the ideal place to be for the expansion of IoT. So solving this problem really actually it's quite a challenging one. If you want to automate the process of onboarding IoT devices, you have certain unique challenges that are somewhat unique to the market. The first thing is the IoT market by definition is very diverse, diverse in terms of hardware from devices running microcontrollers all the way up to running kind of high level server class processors and then operating systems. You may have something that's a classic real time operating system. You may have Windows, you may have Linux. Clearly, most of the devices you're actually onboarding, by definition, you know, don't have displays. So that in itself brings challenges. Connectivity varies greatly. It may be wired, it may be wireless. Um, and we've, as we've already talked, I mean, the, old, the process that you're looking at today of manual uh, onboarding, um, it's not unusual based on the data we've been shared for the cost of the onboarding to actually exceed the cost of the physical device itself. So you know, when you look at, the, uh, customers are looking at the ROI for their program, really this onboarding task, you know, becomes more than just a, a you know, a roadblock. It's really a source of quite uh, high level friction, both at the financial level and at the resource level in terms of deployment as well. And then, you know, certainly last but not least, there's a certain innate assumption that whoever is installing the IoT device requires trust, and that's physical trust, meaning they're allowed to be in the premise of where they're installing the device. But also, you know, th in terms of things like network trust, credential trust, and obviously, who knows, maybe they leave the company, uh, you're looking at potentially a disgruntled employee, and that in itself opens up a wide range of issues. So there's a number of things here that need to get solved. So the obvious question, I guess, is, you know, what are the alternatives? Before even FIDO started to look at this problem, you know, could it have been solved um, using existing technology? Well, I think we talked about manual onboarding there, really. Clearly, it's slow, it's insecure, and it's expensive. So I don't think that's the way forward, even though it's the way we've been doing it for the last few decades. Now, you may say, well, hey, I've seen some solutions out there that claim to be zero touch. You know, what's the issue there? And I think the challenge is, is that most of those, number one, are proprietary solutions, which means they're really either linked to one particular cloud platform. And obviously, you know, that's great if you're only going to load devices onto a particular platform, but maybe you're looking at an ecosystem where you need to be able to 
purchase the device and load it onto any platform. I mean, it could be multiple uh, cloud service providers that you're working with. It may be on-premise, it may be off-premise. Secondly, some of these solutions are really tied very much to a particular silicon vendor. And again, obviously that can be limiting. Um, and then the last one, we'll come back to this in a minute, is that many of the solutions that do exist today, they work on the assumption that you know which platform you want to onboard to at the point of manufacture. And obviously, whilst that can technically work, that again adds friction and cost. Because in reality, what you really want to do is for companies, OEMs and ODMs, is to man manufacture a physical device, ship it through their supply chain to maybe it sits in the distributor. And at that point, that device effectively is, I'll call it vanilla. It doesn't know where it's going to be on board. It doesn't care. It's only at the point of installation that the owner or the customer makes a decision. And the solutions today really don't offer that capability. So how did FIDO address this? Well, first things first, we uh, really, as Andrew pointed out, the great thing about the FIDO Alliance is we had some you know, really excellent membership to, to be able to dip into, if you like. So back in the summer of 2019, we pulled together the key cloud service providers, semiconductor manufacturers, really secure uh, specialists in the security field and others into a room to really talk about the problem. The first kind of thing that came out is everyone agreed it needed solving. The second thing we did is we didn't jump to an immediate answer. We started with use cases. About 45 use cases were submitted by different companies and these were effectively grouped to drive a set of requirements. And then we made the next question was, should we start with a white sheet of paper or should we look at uh, an existing solution that had already been developed? And a few solutions were looked at that already existed one of which was the Intel Secure Device on board. And the working group, having looked at those uh, alternate solutions, made the decision that the SDO technology was the best foundation for this work. It didn't meet all the requirements, but it met many of the requirements. And so we took that and have built upon that specification that was contributed. Um, so let's kind of cut to the benefits. The vision for FDO, FIDO device onboard, is a pretty simple one. How do you create an onboarding solution that says, let me drop ship a device in its cardboard box. It came straight maybe from the manufacturer a week ago, a month ago. You deliver it to the point of installation. An installer, maybe they're semi-skilled, basically connect it to the network, power it up, and then the whole installation process really happens in a, a fully um, automatic or autonomous way. So number one, it needs to be zero touch for the person doing the installation. It needs to be pretty quick. We set a target of about a minute, somewhat processor dependent. Clearly needs to be secure. Flexibility on the hardware. I mean, you may be using a small microcontroller, as I said, you may be using a heavyweight uh, processor for a data center. And again, it needs to be able to work on all of those and everything in between. It may be uh, an internet cloud that you're, you're connecting to. It could be a completely proprietary on-premise solution. So it needs to be able to support all of those. And then the point we'll come to in a minute, late binding. This is the kind of in, the, the element that I hinted at a minute ago, which is, can I make that decision at the point of installation where I want to onboard the devices? And so FDO delivers on all of those. Now that in itself, I think, you know, frankly, I think is a, is a great step forward, but we've taken it a little bit further, which is we obviously want people to not only adopt the specification, but we want people to be able to take advantage of it quickly. And so in parallel, Fido has been working with Linux Foundation Edge, we had a project set up there um, last summer. It's called SDO for historic reasons, but basically the project is set up to implement the FDO specification. The software, as you'll see in a minute, it now all resides on GitHub, so it's all available to everyone on this call. That will allow you to basically download the, the software and start executing on FDO today. And so, you know, we'll show you a little bit about that in a minute, but we're bringing together not just the specification, but we're providing open source software that supports that specification. I mentioned this, so I won't, you know, really uh, belabor it too much. Um, really call out here to Bill Curtis, who did this slide, and I thank him many times for this, but really he showed what is it the, the, from a supply chain viewpoint that you solve with FDO? And the answer is with existing 
uh, technologies, as I mentioned, they really require that all the credentials be placed in the device at manufacture, which means that you almost end up with a situation where every customer has their own unique SKU. And obviously from a supply chain, that adds a lot of friction. If you look at FDO, that isn't how it works, as I'll explain in a second. You basically create one single SKU it passes through the supply chain and it's at the point of installation, that's when you need to make a decision which cloud, which client you want to onboard to. And clearly by doing that late binding, uh, that's where we're really driving, you know, really reducing the friction in the supply chain. Now, again, the solution that we've been working on here, obviously, you know, that, that you have to look at where does it bring the most value? Certainly, we focused initially on industrial and enterprise applications. Maybe it's a gateway, a sensor, maybe it's medical, it could be industrial or enterprise. Um, consumer is something that's in our mind, but that's something I think we'll, you know, be revisiting a little bit in the future. Forgive me, I think we have a little bit of background noise here as well. Um, certainly, multi ecosystem. Uh, applications where you're building a device that you know may likely be integrated to a range of different platforms. And obviously, if you have a more complex supply chain, that again is where FDO brings particular value. Now, how does FDO work? I'll go through it fairly quickly, and then we've got you know questions we can answer at the end with, with Geary. So number one, if we start at the point of manufacturing here, we end up where three or th three things basically happen. First thing, we uh, place the software, the FDO software agent into the physical device itself. Number two, we assume that there's a route of trust. I'm gonna mute for just 10 seconds. Sorry, folks. Um, the other element that takes place is we inject the software. Number two, we, need, we assume there's a root of trust where the device itself can actually uniquely identify itself. Now, we are very flexible here. You can use things like ECDSA keys. You can use the EPID key, which is used in Intel devices. You can store it inside the file system. You can store it with a secure element. You can use the TPM. So lots of flexibility on how you do that. This means that you can use FDO on products you may have designed three years ago or five years ago or ones you're working on today. The next element we're doing is we create it manufacturing this concept of an ownership voucher, which is that little uh, red key there we show in the white circle. And that really is this digital proof of ownership. And it effectively takes the form of a, of a uh, text file, but it's an encrypted key that passes through the supply chain in parallel with the physical device itself, which remains in its box. You eventually come to the point uh, where you decide to onboard it. The first thing you need to do is you say, hey, I've made my decision. I want to onboard to this particular cloud. So what I do then is I register the, the device itself to say, hey, you know, this is my device and I want to onboard to you. It's registered then with what we call the rendezvous server, which basically acts as a redirect. It says, hey, when this device wakes up and calls me, I know that its most likely owner is this cloud here over to my side. And so then we get to the point at number four, the device powers up, it calls home to the rendezvous server and it can be server or servers. It says, hey, here's my uh, route of trust. Here's who I am. You know, show me, you know, show me where I, I should go. Effectively, it has its own capability to, to identify itself, I should say, maybe a better way of putting it. It's then pointed at the target cloud. The target cloud and the device then can mutually authenticate against each other. Um, as I said, the device itself has a route of trust. The cloud it has the ownership voucher. The two can then authenticate, set up a secure encrypted tunnel between them. And at that point, you can then provision what you need to. Maybe it's credentials that you need to provide. Maybe it's a, an agent that's unique to your software platform. That's when you can kind of basically go ahead and deliver that work payload. I'm going to show this briefly just to say from a software lens, this is another way of looking at things. What does the overall picture look like? 
So number one, I've shown the uh, IoT device itself, which obviously is going to have some form of processor. And so inside of that, we provide a client, number one, which can be run on a range of different processors, and it can take advantage of things like TPMs. Number two, we have... Um, what we call the manufacturing tool, which is used in the supply chain effectively to not only provide the credentials that go into the device, but it also generates the ownership voucher. Number three is this so-called rendezvous server, which acts as this kind of redirect. And again, this rendezvous server number three can be on-premise or it can be in the cloud. Again, that's a decision that can be made by the end customer or whoever is deploying the service. Number four is the actual owner code that runs inside of your tire target cloud or on-prem solution. And then last but not least, should you have some kind of supply chain where you've got VARs and distributors, there's a version of the manufacturing tool that sits there and effectively allows that ownership voucher to be extended through, through like a Russian doll as it passes its way through the supply chain. Now I'll move on briefly. Um, I did talk about the software being available. The project is in uh, Linux Foundation Edge. If you go there, you'll see it under the name Secure Device Onboard. We'll likely be updating that in the future to say FIDO uh, Device Onboard. You'll see the software. Just a quick uh, data point. Right now we have alpha code up there, but we expect to have a full production release kind of late summer this year. So we're really not at all far away. So with that, I'd like to hand the, hand the presentation over to Gary and I'll, I'll mute. Thank you, Richard. Um, and uh, by the way, I've been trying to answer questions on the chat, but I'm going to, but um, I'm going to have to move away from that. But I mean, we are going to have uh, time to also go through the questions on chat uh, during the Q and A session. So I appreciate uh, all the interest that the audience is showing. So our goals for the upcoming year are threefold. We're planning to drive industry adoption by continuing our efforts to build a, to, to build an ecosystem across end users, uh, OEMs and ODMs, original equipment manufacturers, original device manufacturers, uh, semiconductor vendors, cloud service providers, uh, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and of course uh, finished product vendors. We also intend to launch a, a launch certification programs uh, later this year, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, uh, starting with uh, functional certification, interoperability validation, and then moving on to security certification. And then we'll continue to work on the next generation of the standard uh, based on implementer feedback and uh, addressing additional requirements that are, that are, that are brought up uh, as, we, as we start to see the FDO uh, ecosystem develop. So I'll speak a little bit about certification and security. FIDO has a, an established security certification program for all the existing FIDO authenticator specifications. FIDO has long has been, had an original mission of striving towards a passwordless world, and several FIDO standards have been developed in that space. Um, the, there's uh, certification levels that have been defined that correspond to what the vendor is determined would be achievable security assurance and what can actually be verified by FIDO. So there's level one, which is just based on a vendor questionnaire. It's a quick turnaround time and it's most suitable for, for instance, downloadable authenticators uh, that you might see in an app store. There's a level two authentica uh, uh, certification, which is based on design documentation provided by the vendor, but verified by a accredited third-party certification lab. And usually that would be more suitable for authenticators developed in a trusted software environment such as ARM Trust Zone, which I noticed was actually uh, asked about specifically in the uh, chat questions. And then finally, level three, say a sample device uh, is submitted to a third-party lab for not just verification of the design, but also additional penetration testing by the certification lab. And this would probably be more suitable for authenticators in, uh, who are, that are instantiated in uh, hard, hardware environments that have provide high levels of security assurance. So for instance, secure elements, TPMs and the like. So uh, 
Uh, we've concluded that the, that these that this approach also makes sense for IoT devices, given the large uh, uh, scope of achievable levels of security assurance. Um, we see IoT devices that range in the low cost in the in the, uh, in the low cost domain. These are simple devices with uh, oftentimes limited crypt uh, cryptography capabilities. Uh, no isolation of the hardware and software that's involved in uh, critical security functionality um, that's required for onboarding. Uh, also, more complex devices with advanced crypto capabilities, even looking into the post-quantum era. Um, there's also a full isolation of security impacting software and even special purpose hardware for all, for all the uh, necessary operations related to onboarding and also uh, also other uh, other security sense of operations. So FIDO is actively developing interoperability and security certification programs. And as I mentioned before, we expect a rollout of these programs by the end of the year. And these security certification requirements will be assessed against regional regulatory requirements. FIDO does recognize that there are several uh, re regional regimes that are, be, that are being developed and announced. Um, FIDO does have a longstanding history of, of working directly with a lot of the uh, regulatory bodies uh, in, in all, all over the world. And then also I'd like to mention that existing FIDO security certification also leverages what we call companion programs, such as the protection profiles defined for common criteria. <clears throat> Now we know that there are several IoT security certification programs that have been announced uh, in, in, in various venues, and FIDO expects to leverage uh, at least a subset of them as potential companion programs. So, in summary, FIDO Alliance ha has a successful track record of bringing standards to market that has been uh, seen in our uh, in meeting our original mission of a passwordless world. We have several uh, authenticator standards that have not only been uh, that have not only been standard standardized, but have an active echo system and uh, and are in use today. And the FDO standard has taken that a step further, and we have now taken our passwordless mission and applied it to the challenge of secure onboarding. And the other thing to the other thing we'd like to point out is that FDO has been driven by cloud semiconductor and security leaders. So if you actually go and download the FDO specification, which is publicly available, you can see uh, that the uh, co-editors run the gamut of the IoT ecosystem, all the way from security manufacturers to finished product vendors to cloud service providers. Uh, who uh, who are putting up uh, who are putting up uh, cloud systems that the IoT devices will interact with? As Richard had mentioned before, we have an uh, we have an open source project to kickstart the developer community, and that's hosted by the Linux Foundation, the Edge Project. There's alpha code available today, and we're expecting the uh, we're expecting full release by the middle of the year. So as I mentioned before, you can download the specification in the Starfire to start using and applying FDO today. And if you're interested in driving the evolution of FDO, please, I encourage all, uh, all attendees, join the FIDO Alliance today. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. All right. So Andrew. Yeah, I was on mute. <laughs> I was just thanking you both for, for the contents and presentation. Um, and, and thanks also to all the attendees uh, for some of the questions that have come in. So this is our Q&A period now. Uh, just one more reminder um, as we sort through these questions, um, please do take the survey at the, end of this, uh, at the end of this webinar to give us your feedback on, on what you saw today and what you want from FIDO moving forward. Um, so first question I'd like to ask is, um, I, I see a question here. You know, who's committed to use FIDO device on board? Is, is you know, do we know about early customers, adopters, both on the, you know, on the device side, on the cloud service provider side? You know, where does this stand today from an adoption standpoint? Mm. So maybe I can help answer that. I mean, uh, 
really right now, you know, the last year and a half, we've been focused very much on driving the specification and driving the software. But as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, we've really kind of built upon some of the work that was done over the last few years on secure device on board. And that's a, a technology that we'd already been working with a number of companies. And so if you look at the press release, you'll see companies such as Molex talking about using this technology because they've been working on it for some time as, as companies such as British Telecom, you'll see some of the other names. Um, one area now that we're really starting to move forward on is obviously bringing in the broader ecosystem of OEMs and ODMs. Until the specification was standardized, it was important not to, shall I say, waste anyone's time by having them invest in something that was likely to get changed anyway. So now we have really, as you heard from Giri, we have the cloud vendors themselves and you know, they have provided quotations in the, in the press release. And again, obviously they'll talk about um, any plans they have to support the technology and that will come directly from them. We have semiconductor companies, you know, such as Intel and ARM that have been very actively involved. And as I said, now we're moving towards really building the overall ecosystem to bring in the device manufacturers themselves. And you'll see a lot of activity from us in the second half of the, this year, really uh, engaging with companies in that supply chain. I will say that, you know, there are certainly um, a, a significant number of companies, I would say, that I'm personally involved with that are now, you know, now that they see the specification in place, they're saying now is the time for them to, to get involved. And I don't mean involved just in terms of driving the specification, but actually as in bringing the software in-house and starting to uh, deploy it and evaluate it in their application. So I think we're now starting to see that kind of uh, deployment model. Okay, that's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, I, I see a handful of questions about certification, and some of those may have come in before Gary presented those slides. But in general, the um, you know certification requirements for this program are, are under development, um, and you know the, the goal is to make this um, all, all public and to, to roll us out before the end of the year. So um, you know, stay tuned for more information on the uh, secure, the certification program requirements. But it will be similar in vain to. Um, how we've approached the um, certified authenticator levels, which, which Gary did talk about uh, during his part of the presentation. Yeah, so I'll add to that. There are a couple of different questions. I'll try to see if I can address yeah. to those. I am obviously not keeping up in the chat window very well. Um, so just in general on FIDO certification, uh, member uh, today with the authenticator certification, members and non-members can apply for it can apply to get their devices certified. There are a list of third-party labs that have been uh, that have been um, approved by FIDO for the certification programs. You can go to the website and see. Um, FIDO, uh, uh, there's, um, there's one question I was answering just now. Are there plans by FIDO to address ongoing security of devices for the period of time that, are, that they are in use? Uh, yes, actually, in the certif our certification program, actually, can uh, it can report when a device is out of compliance based on, for instance, when a uh, uh, when a uh, the vendor has to uh, push out a patch and he's still developing that patch. Now that's just that we try to actually be consistent with best security practices. So uh, when a security researcher raises an issue with a particular device, um, usually, usually the security researcher would actually go to the vendor first and give them a chance to actually come up with a fix before publicly announcing it. FIDO works in that same space as well. But um, we do have an obligation to, to ensure that devices are stay compliant with, with, with uh, certification, even when they're in the market. Um, there was a question about the U.S. government having been approached about the FIDO concept. Um, we have actually, uh, actually, NIST is, uh, NIST is a, uh, a member of FIDO. Um, we have communicated and commented on, uh, 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 and provided public uh, comments in the public comment period for some of the uh, uh, relevant NIST IoT guidance that has come out uh, during the past, uh, past year. So we, we expect this to continue to evolve. Um, as uh, as the U.S. federal government uh, starts to actually determine how they uh, how they want to uh, address uh, security certification, not just uh, 
for government vendors, but uh, for, for government suppliers, but just for uh, consumers in general in the U.S. market. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, and I guess I and I guess I like to reemphasize. Uh, I know there was a question about uh, who who obtains a certification. Does Intel or ARM? Um, this is um, something that we're going to have. We're going to look at about the uh, uh, during the development of certification program. There is a concept that's some that's called competent level certification. And um, for instance, if a semiconductor vendor obtains a, a certain level of certification from, for instance, common criteria. As I mentioned, the use of companion, companion programs, that can actually be consi considered as part of any eventual I IoT certification. Um, we know certification uh, is very expensive to go through, and, uh, and you know, it, it, we don't necessarily want to have the finished product vendor have to go through it multiple times if, it, if, if if uh, certain parts of the uh, sub of their uh, of their product have already been uh, verified, yeah. all right. So um, <clears throat> one other note: so on the U.S. government front, the related question that related data point is, um, you know, we, we see a lot of regulatory activity around IoT, and particularly kind of the, this 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 part of IoT, and so. I was part part of our ongoing policy efforts. We're, we're actively engaging with different governments who are, you know, seeking to, um, you know, create policies and, and and regulations in this space. So not just U.S. government, but other governments around the world as well. This is obviously a space that um, has a lot of focus, um, you know, for security, productivity, and and, and general business uh, business reasons. Okay, some more questions. We also, just to note, we have um, one of the experts from the working group, Jeff Cooper from Intel, has joined the, the chat, and so he'll be answering some of your questions uh, directly. Um, by, uh, we we by, may uh, be even both answering the same question, so hopefully the uh, answers are the same. Uh, well, look, so there, there's several questions on the rendezvous server, so I'm wondering who could, who could bite that one off. Sure. Sure, there, there are some instructions for how to find the rendezvous server that are included in, um, in some information that's sent through the supply chain. Um, this is, the information is called an ownership voucher and it includes uh, the device certificate and it also includes an authentication credential, which is a, an innovation that's in, in uh, FDO that allows the, the device to authenticate and know that this is the correct um, um, owning DMS, owning device management system to connect to. Um, and as part of that, there is a, a set of instructions that both the device and the, the DMS have uh, to, to connect to the rendezvous server, and that's how they find the rendezvous server. And it might, you might have to try more than one to get, to get an agreement. So, so some related questions to rendezvous server, uh, service. So uh, one note here, um, it feels like a centralized process. Is it projected to be decentralized? Can it, can it you can have multiple rendezvous services. Um, it is possible to federate them. Um, we haven't developed a spec for that at this point, but we've discussed the possibility and we believe it's possible. Um, it's also possible to run a rendezvous service in a closed network. And one of the things that I would want to emphasize is that the FIDO protocol specifically supports um, running everything in a closed network. There was earlier a um, uh, uh, question about disconnected uh, hosts that are disconnected from their controlling entity part of the time and and uh, and that's also supported through closed networks and then one, one last question hi Jeff um, on, on this can the rendezvous service be, be spoofed how do we how do we prevent spoofing so um, we did a lot of security analysis on the protocol and um, there there is there are some low-level ways of spoofing, et cetera, but actually the information that goes into the rendezvous service is actually signed by the, the owner and um, and then verified. So, so it is possible for the device to detect if it's being spoofed. Um, and actually, the other thing I'll say is that the rendezvous service, the only thing it does is to connect the device to the correct uh, controlling cloud uh, or, or controller device management service. So it, it actually doesn't um, instruct the device and it doesn't get any information from the device. So um, so there's a there's a there's always a possibility of a DOS attack in any solution, but we think we've minimized it. Okay. Um, 
So a couple questions I see just looking at theme. There's so many questions, by the way. So we probably won't get to them all, um, and, and we'll do our best to follow up on those that we, we don't get answers to. And we'll certainly do probably a follow up um, to this webinar. Uh, we do have kind of a, a standard kind of ask us anything a series of webinars, or we could probably just have an open open session on this. It's something interesting we're seeing. Um, I see several questions around device updates. Um, you know, how do we how are the devices updated? Are they updated? How does, how does that process work through FDO? Um, so um, during, so there are two ways to answer that question. So one approach is, do you want to, um, are there some updates that are essential before you can onboard the device? And, and those updates you can actually apply during the uh, FDO process. So there is the ability to download um, additional uh, data to the device, additional credentials, and uh, we have a fairly flexible mechanism. If you have, for example, um, the, the Linux software update mechanisms, you can actually activate them during, uh, during onboarding, so you can actually update the software on the device, install new drivers. So you can do that much, and you need to be able to do that much to be able to have the flexibility to connect to any device management service. Um, and once you've connected to it, we assume the device management service will also know how to manage the device. So if you're doing a full overhaul of the device, you probably would want to do that through the device management service. If the device management service needs some tweaking on the device to be able to talk to it in the first place, that's a good thing to put into FDO. Okay. Uh, Richard, Gary, do you, do you see any other questions? Do you see any questions there you want to jump in and, and address? Yeah, um, maybe just a couple of comments. Um, one, I saw questions about, you know, wh which CSPs are supporting FDO. Um, obviously, in terms of their product plans, that's something they will announce. So at the moment, I think if you see the press release, several of them have put in quotes. Uh, but in terms of the specific dates and times of when they would offer a service, that would come directly from, from them. Um, another, just a couple of points I would say, one, if people want more information, there are some papers that we've provided that kind of cover some of the material we've covered here. And in the upcoming weeks, we're working on a very detailed white paper that goes far, far deeper than this webinar. And we'll make that you know broadly available through the FIDO Alliance. So uh, again, you know, for those of you that want to go deeper. And then there was a question I saw about, you know, and maybe I'll paraphrase it about, you know, hey, if I want, you know, support, how can I, you know, how can I get it? Um, I'll interpret that as saying software support. It may not have been, it may be with respect to the to the specification. But if you actually should go to GitHub and, and to Linux Foundation Edge and download the software and you start to get a, a you know some questions or you need a little bit of help. Um, there is a team as part um, that we're actively supporting within Linux Foundation Edge. You can either reach out through that organization or frankly, you can reach to me directly and we can put you in touch with some application engineers that can help you. And it, whether you're just setting up a system to you know kick the tires on it, maybe you're an OEM, you'd like to try and see, can you onboard your device? any of those um you know are something we'd be more than happy to help you with so as i said either go through linux foundation edge um or you can reach me directly and you know we'll put you in touch with the right folk so richard can you can you address something about the use of the ownership voucher um there seems to have been several questions that have uh, popped up in the uh in the chat window on this on that yeah, or maybe, sorry, I'm getting spammed my by my own team's work. Um, did you see any of them, Jeff, that you want to jump in? I, I'm trying to read them now. So so the let me just uh, explain a little bit. So the ownership voucher is a mechanism by which um, the device gets identified to the, the, uh, the owner of the device, and the owner of the device can use it to authenticate to the device. And uh, in, in um, in, in a conventional situation that you see today, the the ownership voucher that that is is in its, let's say the that would map to the ownership voucher in its when it comes out of the factory, but one of the the things we have in the FDO is we have the ability to extend the ownership voucher as it goes through the supply chain, and this allows us to decide where the device is being routed, and and you you need that kind of mechanism because you need to have the ability to say warehouse devices or break pallets and send some of the devices to one place and some to another place. We don't think that everyone has to do this. For example, you don't have to do this to FedEx a device from one place to another. 
um, but but it's a capability that we think you need to have. And then the ownership voucher is a new mechanism for for authenticating specifically devices uh, in the supply chain by using the supply chain trust to onboard the device. And and I think you can probably beyond that you'd have to go into the spec and take a look at it. I'm sure I could go on for about thirty or forty minutes. <laughs> Okay. Um, let's yeah. see. Uh, here's a very pointed question. How, how does single SKU and late binding coexist with zero touch install? I don't know if we addressed that yet. I mean, to me, z th those are sort of two separate sides of the same coin. When you talk zero touch in my mind, it's the very fact that the person doing the installation effectively, the actual installer doesn't have to do anything other than power the device up and provide network connectivity or have that provided. The other side of it obviously is okay, you know, that so for the installer the task is easy, but at some point, you know, you have to decide where do I want to onboard it. But I think in this case, what we've done is if you like separated those paths. So that the person, let's say, take a you know an example. I buy a hundred devices. I may take own, take you know control of those ownership vouchers. I'm the person who's procuring them, or maybe I'm procuring them on behalf. I'm a system integrator procuring them on behalf of an end customer. I've decided that I, all of these are going to get onboarded to cloud X, you know, with my client. I would then provide those ownership vouchers then and forward them forward so that they basically are awaiting at the rendezvous server. So me as the overall manager of the platform, if you like, would handle that as a batch. And then those individual physical devices, which may, of course, I may never have seen, would ship through to the installer. They open the box. They actually, you know, power them up and connect them to the network. So it's the the, the beauty of this approach is it really separates the person who makes the decision of where they get onboarded to ver versus the person doing the zero touch install, which is the actual physical plugging the device in and having it, you know, connect to the platform. Um, there was some questions, I think, about network access. And, I, and again, I'll let Jeff jump in here. I mean, obviously, in some cases, the network can be provided fairly readily. In other cases, you know, we, we haven't to date really specified how that happens. Um, there is some work that we're doing, uh, some proposals that have been made by members of FIDO, which we think can ease that in the case of things like Wi-Fi, as an example, that can really reduce any friction there. So at the moment, we don't kind of dictate how that's done, um, but there is work afoot to kind of, if you like, simplify that. So Jeff, I don't know if you want to, or, or Giri, add to that. Well, the NIST has um, has done a little bit of work trying to understand the difference between network onboarding and application onboarding, ecosystem onboarding. And one of the things to think about is network onboarding is I get onto the network and then I don't have any capabilities other than the fact that I got onto the network. We're doing application onboarding where we're once we're on the network, we're able to go and identify with an application and the device comes up and becomes live and, and does everything. So, so obviously you need to have some kind of network onboarding. Now, there are multiple network onboarding mechanisms that are being developed for different kinds of networks, and we will hook into those. Um, so, for example, for Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi Alliance has some some has a, an Easy Connect mechanism, which is which is coming out now, and and it will be deployed, and that that would work very well with uh, FDO. Uh, the other possibility is that you might have an onboarding network. And that could be caused, uh, created by, say, a little proxy device, say, a little connector device that connects you into the network just enough to do FDO. And then during FDO, you could send network credentials down. So we think that there will be some ad hoc solutions that are used um, to get started. And then as time goes on, the, each of the networks will have to have a network uh, onboarding solution that goes with that network. And then we'll hook into that. The device manufacturers will couple the two and uh, you'll run the network solution, get you on the network, and then you run the automatic onboarding solution for the application, and that could be FDO. Um, a couple of questions I'll, I'll, I'll address, and then I'll 
send one back to the, the, the panel here. Um, I see some questions on you know, general like relation between FDO and what we'll call kind of traditional you know, FIDO authentication or user authentication. Um, you know, is this, are they the same? Or, you know, how, how do they, how do they vary? So, you know, this, this is a, um, you know, a new piece of work for FIDO, entirely new, um, you know, from, you know, the FIDO authentication specifications. Um, that being said, um, there certainly are some, some common, you know, themes and, and common elements, if you will. So, um, the first one is, you know, just trying to reduce reliance on passwords, right? So, you know, for users, for you know, individuals, you know, users, um, user passwords can get compromised and, and cause issues. And likewise, you know, IoT you know, device passwords can put the internet in trouble. So, so trying to you know, reduce reliance and, and take the password out of IoT, if you will, not just for security, but for uh, simplicity. You know, simplicity in user authentication comes down to easier access to services. In this case, you know, the, the, the faster onboarding of devices, um, both at, at um, point of manufacturing as well as at, at point of implementation. Um, another, you know, reasonable analogy is a focus on public key cryptography. Um, of course, FIDO authentication is using public key cryptography to, um, to authenticate users. And likewise, FDO um, uses a device key uh, with PKI to identify the device. Um, so, you know, there's other, you know, analogies that we draw between the two, but this absolutely is a new work area for us. Um, and, and we're, you know, happy to see the, the initial progress. Likewise, we have some questions on, um, you know, who's taking part in this effort? Um, do we have, you know, X class, certain classifications of device vendors? Uh, the answer is, you know, we've seen several companies, you know, join FIDO Alliance, uh, to help drive this initiative, but we certainly you know, do want more experts um, as we look at e evolving the spec moving forward. There was a question kind of about um, if people go to the Linux Foundation Edge program to sort of take download the code, uh, you know, how much effort is there needed? And the answer is not very much simply in that a lot of, A, you know, all of the software elements you need are there, B, um, there are some uh, environments that have been set up that basically let you take some simulated devices. So if you sort of say, look, I just want to kind of see how the whole technology operates, but I don't want to necessarily for stage one incorporate um, the client in my own IoT device, you know, you don't have to. There's uh, an environment that lets you do that. And then in terms of overall infrastructure, um, it's you know pretty light. If you if you want to kick the tires on it using say something like a, a small Linux box, then uh, you know Raspberry Pi or a Nook, something like that. You know that's pretty trivial. And things like the Rendezvous server, if you choose to run that kind of in your own facility for evaluation, again it's a light compute load, and you can run it on Nooks, which is what we use often for for demonstrations and the like. So the answer is you really don't need um, too much of anything to kind of get yourself going. And again, if if you have any you know hit any bumps in the road, um, you know reach out to the people in in that working group, and you know we can provide some help there. Thanks. Richard, so, so another kind of grouping and theme of questions um, we're seeing is around certificates. Um, so, so Gary, do you want to bite this off? Yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a stab. And there was some question on PKI. So um, there are two flavors of attestation in, in FDO. Uh, there's the EPID attestation, Enhanced Privacy ID, uh, and the uh, and the uh, and there's the uh, something called the Entity Attestation Token. Uh, well. There, there's actually a little. There's actually a little bit more than that, but all all of those can leverage uh, five or nine certificates. I think the the thing we need to be uh, uh, the thing we're looking into actively in FIDO is FIDO has a long-standing um, privacy principles requirement, and we we try. And we're not trying to prevent uh, tracking of individuals uh, in the sense that we're not going to. We know we're not going to solve that problem in total. But we do want to actually strive to make sure FIDO is not the source of that. Uh, when an individual gets tracked, we're trying to make sure the FIDO technology isn't the source of that. So there is some, uh, there are some considerations that vendors can take in that direction. For instance, if a uh, if a certificate is individualized to a device, that may be something that you may want you know, after onboarding is has taken place. That may be a certificate that uh, that should be replaced, so it's not used to track the owner. Um, because we know that devices could go through multiple uh, 
multiple different iterations. Uh, use, one user can take ownership of the device, take it to factory, reset, resell it. Then another user can take ownership of the device. We don't want those breadcrumbs to be following them. And that actually goes back to our original uh, use cases that uh, that we discussed earlier in this earlier uh, in the presentation as the founding principle for starting this whole effort. So, um, I think uh, I, I I hope that kind of covered the uh, the um, the topic. Uh, Jeff, did you want to did you want to discuss anything specifically on uh, on the uh, intersection of EPID and uh, and PKI? So so EPID is a form of PKI that. Um, allows a, the authentication to be group-based, and FDO was designed to be able to use um, the Enhanced Privacy ID. That's what EPID stands for. Um, one of the, the the idea of the Enhanced Privacy ID is that not only um, can, that, that you, you have a limited ability to be able to trace the device by using the public certificate of the device as a, as a credential that identifies the device. So, so when you think about devices that are being automatically onboard, boarded, you have to think about whether there's a possibility of tracing the device um, and, and imagine that somehow you got hold of all the public keys the public certificate certificates for the devices. Would you be able to trace them? In in Epid, there are about a million devices for every uh, certificate, and and um, so that that is a sort of a different kind of a technology, and it allows the um, the the owner of the device to have some a little bit more confidence that the device couldn't be transported. Now, it's important to understand that during FTO. While you're on FDO, the device um, is signing, for example, and if whether it's EPID or it's not EPID, uh, there, you know, it, there, that signature will be visible during that period. Um, but during FDO, there will be a private transaction where the device can be re-certified, -certif or let's say a new certificate can, can be put into the device. Um, so all the credentials the device will use while it's in operation will actually be unrelated to the, device, the credentials that are used during operation. So even if you have some, um, if you're using, say, an ECDSA certificate uh, and you have some ability to trace the device when it's running FDO to when it's running FDO again, you still won't be able to trace the device while it's in operation. I think that's a really important point. Mm. Jeff, one that sort of uh, adder on to that, I noticed one person was asking the question of, they, they were questioning, hey, do you need to know who, at manufacturer who the end customer is so that you can, the question is, can you con to configure the ownership voucher? And the answer mm -hmm. is clearly, you know, n no. Um, the way the system works is it manufacture, right. the, the, the key value of FTO is that you don't expressly don't need to know who's going to buy it. You have end up with the physical device and you end up with the ownership voucher that pass through the supply chain. And it's only at the point of installation that you then, the person who takes control of that physical device and that ownership voucher, and you know, yes, it could be a system integrator as an example, they are the person then that then says, hey, I have 100 devices here that I'm going to onboard to client number 43 inside mm -hmm. cloud X. And so, no, it, manufacturing all the devices are vanilla. All of the ownership vouchers are vanilla. There, there is, by vanilla, I mean they're not in any way associated to any end user or any end cloud or any end platform. They're all built exactly the same way. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes. Well, hey, look, so we're, we're at time here. Um, just a, a couple of comments. You know, first of all, um, you know, this is the, the most engagement we've had in any webinar I've, I've facilitated. Uh, the number of questions. Uh, the number of you that have stayed on during Q&A. So it shows me there's just a ton of interest and enthusiasm around this, so thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do, and I'd like to ask the panelists, um, would you be willing to come back and just do like an office hours open open uh, question session? Sure, I, I can I, I can certainly make myself available for that. I'll put you on the spot, but maybe we have David Turner, our Director uh, of Technical Standards, facilitate it and you know, get, get some added. Let's have an open session. Yeah. There, there's so much, there, we, we, you know, very impressed by the number and, and the detail in these questions. So we'll line that up and add a future date. Um, so again, we're, we're going to end here. So thank you all for, for coming today. Please do take the um, take the survey. If you want to get engaged with Fido Alliance and drive this work, just send us an email at info at fidoalliance.org or visit the website. Um, and we will look forward to seeing, uh, seeing you all in the future Fido webinar. Thank you and have a good day.
Thank you.